Thanks, everybody. All right. Um, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, again, and welcome to our audience who are on Zoom. Um, I'm Vanessa Parley. I direct the research programs here at HAI, and I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Jeff Kares, our speaker today. Uh, Jeff is a professor of Earth and Planetary at Stanford University Dewar School of Sustainability. His research interests are in decision making under uncertainty, developing the critical mineral supply as well as geothermal energy required to transition to 100% renewable energy. Jeff is founder of the Mineral X Initiative, a community building effort to strengthen stewardship for a prosperous future for all. And he has co-authored or authored five books in the area of decision-making under uncertainty. He was awarded the Crumbian Medal of International Association for Mathematical Geosciences for career achievement. And in today's seminar, Jeff will argue that pulling off the challenge of cutting greenhouse emissions by 2050 requires building, building intelligent agents to speed up and scale how we mine for minerals the creation of geothermal energy, and how we think about geological storage of CO2. Uh, before, the before we begin the presentation, a few logistics. Uh, for our Zoom audience, you can use the Zoom chat to message the group, but if you have questions, please use Slido. The link will be in the chat shortly. Um, you can click that link. Um, and then the, a new window will come up and you can type in your questions. I will be choosing questions from Slido after the presentation. And Slido has a nice upvote feature so that you can upvote questions that you are most interested in hearing. Uh, live audience, we do have QR codes around the room in the case you want to log into Slido. Um, but I will be um, rotating between online questions and in-person questions during the Q&A. All right, let's begin. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, there we go. Well, thanks, uh, Vanessa, for that introduction, and uh, great to be here uh, today to speak to uh, such a nice and diverse audience. So I'd like to start off uh, right away with uh, acknowledging uh, my collaborators. Uh, we have a big team now at the Mineral X Initiative, uh, which I will talk about uh, as well. We have a strong collaboration with uh, Michael Kochendorfer and his lab, Sizzle. Uh, and uh, we're also, of course, collaborating with companies in the real world. OMV is an Austrian energy company that is going into geothermal energy. And Cobalt Metals is a startup company in Silicon Valley here, actually in Berkeley, that looks at developing critical mineral supply. So, renewable energy. Uh, one, a, a big part of Net Zero 2050 is renewable energy. And so because the Paris Agreement has now passed for about seven, eight years, we start to wonder whether we should not go to 100% renewable energy immediately. And there's some movement, including here on campus, by Mark Jacobson to, to look into that. Uh, so this talk is not about policy. This is talk about doing things, about engineering things, about really getting your hands dirty. Uh, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of manufacturing. It's going to take a lot of building. And so the question is, how do we speed all of that up uh, to mitigate the climate crisis that we're facing? So let's think a bit about renewable energy and what it really requires. So wind and solar, uh, very well uh, known to you probably. Uh, water, we're going to, have, uh, for example, use pumped hydro, just pumping water up. So we have storage of energy and also for green hydrogen. The elements I will talk about is the one at the bottom, which is the Earth's heat and Earth's minerals. So Earth's heat or geothermal energy is used for uh, heating buildings, cooling buildings, and also for electricity production. And Earth's minerals is going to be used for a lot of materials we need to be building uh, to get to 100% renewable energy. So let's think about heating and cooling. Uh, and I'd like to have an ex show an example of a, a collaboration I'm just starting with Nanjing University around heating and cooling in the Yangtze River Delta. So the Yangtze River Delta is a very populated area of 235 million people. Uh, their uh, heating and cooling comes from electricity. Uh, that means they use devices in their homes. And that electricity is produced with coal. 
So we're burning coal to make electricity to then make heat. So that is, of course, not very renewable. So what are alternatives to that? One alternative is what is called shallow geothermal energy. So shallow geothermal energy is where we're using the subsurface or the shallow subsurface, which is at constant temperature. And we're using devices which are called heat pumps to move up and down basically heat. So in the summer, it would be cooling, and in the winter, it would be heating. Uh, so to design that uh, system, we have to know whether there's any shallow geothermal potential. And so that potential has been mapped and see here study by people in that area. And you see that there is a significant potential uh, in areas of China that are very well populated. But that doesn't necessarily give you energy. What we now need to do is engineer those systems. And engineering those systems, now we have to think local, right? We have to think about what's sitting under buildings. And to do that, we have to look at things like what is thermal conductivity? What is the volumetric heat capacity? What is the groundwater flow? Those are all local phenomena. So the question is, is there local potential? And how can we figure that out? What information would we need to acquire in order to do that? And then how do we engineer those systems? And how to do that all very fast? Where that's already going to happen, and that is where I collaborate with the Austrian oil company, is Vienna. Uh, so Vienna uh, is a smaller city, obviously, in Europe. Uh, and in Vienna, we have a known heat source. So it's already been determined uh, that's the case. In fact, the Vienna Basin is an oil and gas exploration or production area. So that heat is already there and has been determined. And so by the end of this year, early next year, they will be drilling into the subsurface to circulate water and use that water heating or, uh, for heating. So what does that mean, drilling in the subsurface? So here we see Vienna, and here we see what is in the subsurface of Vienna, right? And so you see uh, an, an area, a geological layer that is permeable, uh, and that we can circulate water. And in that geological layer, we see that we have a temperature distribution, uh, which is favorable for shallow geothermal and for, for heating. It's not favorable for electricity. For electricity, you would have to go 150 degrees or higher. So here we see we have that. So how is this done? You see that they, a company would drill a, a well quite deep, right? They were talking about 1,000 meters, 2,000 meters, and will then circulate water that is then used uh, for, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, district heating. Right? So we'll have many buildings that will be then heated by this geothermal power. The other thing you notice here on this uh, layer is these lines uh, here, for example, right, which are false. And those are important to know. Why? Because if we look at a case in Korea, we get like a 5.4 magnitude earthquake due to geothermal energy production. So that is not a desirable effect, obviously. And that means that we have to be very careful for that. Why is that happening? That is because faults in the subsurface may uh, be points where earthquakes and rupture happen. And those earthquakes can happen because fluids are pressurizing or changing the pressure field in the subsurface. Uh, so that is a big problem, right? Because if we start doing geothermal energy, and we're going to do this in an unsafe fashion, that will be the end of geothermal energy. Nobody's going to accept that. Another area um, of heat, uh, which is not related to Earth, is industrial heat. Uh, so these are called what we call hard to abate industries in terms of their CO2 uh, emissions. Right? You have cement factories and steel factories. We still need those for the forecoming future. Uh, for making our infrastructure. So the problem is then, what do we do with that? Because we are combusting fossil fuels at very high temperatures, and so what is replacing that? There are replacement ideas in the future, which are green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is you produce hydrogen using the sun, electrolysis, uh, energy from the sun, electrolysis, and you will get hydrogen. 
So the hydrogen becomes now a new fuel and that can burn cleanly. There's also ideas around biofuels, but the question of course is, are we going to be able to develop that in time? And should we also look at other alternatives, which means keep essentially burning the, the uh, fossil fuels, but capturing the CO2 and then storing the CO2 underground, which is called carbon capture and storage. But again, in carbon capture and storage, we're facing hazards, safety issues, right? When we start injecting now uh, gases that become liquids in the subsurface, there's always uh, a risk that these will leak. And so if they're leaking, then we'll make themselves back to the surface, which is not exactly what we want and may in fact contaminate uh, groundwater system. So now we have a double jeopardy uh, to deal with, which is that of leakage and also induced seismicity. Okay, let's move to the next one, which is the materials economy or the earth materials. I think many of you, uh, yesterday was a fantastic moment in my house where uh, they were installing solar panels. And at one point they said, we're gonna have to cut the power. And when the power comes on, it will be on the solar panels. So suddenly the lights goes off and then the lights come on. And when they come on, it's all green energy. That's a fantastic moment. I drive a Bolt EV, so I charge my vehicle at home. This, are, this works, right? These are things that work. Uh, and they're also very cheap. Now these days, relatively cheap. You can now buy a Bolt EV for $30,000 and you can install, install solar panels on my house for $12,000. Right? And that is thanks to the Biden uh, uh, law that was passed, the uh, Enforcement Act, the uh, Reduction Act. So let's then think about what that requires. So for batteries, uh, there's a lot of work done here on campus on developing battery technology, uh, and that is great. Um, and so, but regardless of what we're going to move forward, it looks like lithium is going to be an important element, right? There's a lot of talk about cobalt. And nickel, they, they may also be very important, uh, but there's also now alternatives emerging uh, for those elements. But what's going to be very important uh, is lithium, and what's going to be probably even more important is copper, right? Because copper is electrification. If you're going to electrify everything, everything's going to require copper. There's copper in your phones, there's copper in your toaster, there's copper everywhere, right? So that's what we're going to need for that. The nice or the good news is that I think today about 80% of all copper is recycled, right? And I'm thinking about recycling. Uh, if you think about lead acid batteries, 95% of those batteries are recycled, right? So there is now an incentive, of course, to develop technology that can recycle lithium batteries. Uh, and that is something that can be developed in Europe that's already uh, needed. Uh, there's a new law that says that at least 50% of the material needs to be recycled. So where do we get that? And how is that going to go? Well, if you look at this curve here, which is the uh, ratio of discoveries to capital expending in exploration over the last couple of decades, it's gone down tenfold, which means that there's less discoveries, despite the fact that there is a promise that more discoveries would lead to uh, better, uh, would actually pay off on investment. So we have to think about why that is. Number one, you have to realize is that uh, mineral exploration is difficult to do because you're looking at a very large area for minerals, like Canada, right? You see in Canada here, we see this green color, which is the nickel potential. Uh, for finding nickel in Canada. So it seems substantial. But you have to think that mineral exploration in the end comes down to finding something that is rather small. Let's show in an example in the next slide what a mineral deposit looks like. It's very small and it is in the subsurface. So to do that, we'll have to do geological field work and we'll have to eventually start drilling into the subsurface. So geological field work, of course, this is actually in Cape Smith, Canada, has been done by cobalt metals, is very slow. Um, so how can we use AI to do improved geological field work? That is one of the things that was done uh, by cobalt metals. 
how can we use AI to speed up or reduce the amount of drilling or target much more efficient the drilling in the subsurface to find these metal deposits? That is the question that we're looking into. Okay, so let's uh, summarize that a little bit. We have Earth's heat, we have Earth's minerals, and we're saying that we need to explore, number one, for large concentrations, right? So what are large concentrations, good concentrations of heat? What are metals in the subsurface, which are large concentrations for electricity? That is important. Once we have found large concentrations, then there is the issue of engineering the whole system, right? I mean, building mines and building infrastructure for geothermal, uh, that needs to be done safely, right, for the geothermal case. And for mining, that needs to be done sustainably. So that's something we will address. And all of that has to be done very fast, executing at speed and scale. So how can AI accelerate? That means how can it now all be done, all of these missions that we talked about, faster? And how can we look at that? planet scale, Africa, Asia, South America. How does that go? So you can almost imagine that 2050 is a big plan. So what is this plan? And how do we plan efficiently? Because if we don't plan efficiently, when we start executing, we'll run into problems down the road. How do we execute efficient plans? If you are a human, we're, we're, we're slow, right? We're, we're going to do mineral exploration, we go in the field, we pick up a rock, it's slow. We also have limited planning horizons. We don't think it's not hard, it's not easy for us to think many decades uh, down the future. We also tend to focus on what we know and we don't focus on what we don't know. And that is something that is a theme that will come back and is an important theme, which is uncertainty. So the promise of artificial intelligence Right? like in the chess playing, is that it has long planning horizons. It can look far ahead, much more than humans can. And what is going to be very, very important is that it can reason about uncertainty that humans cannot. To give you a cute example, everyone knows Wordle. Everyone has heard about Wordle, right? So humans can solve the Wordle problem. But we are going to now play Wordle in German, right? With the unknown amount of letters, and where only the probability of the letter is being revealed to you. How would you solve that problem? That is going to take you forever. AI can do that very fast, right? We have uncertainty. We don't know the size of the problem. And we need to make decisions. That is the word for computer in German. Okay, so it's important to then, I think, start formulating the problem. Right? Not think about algorithms, but really think about how we formulate problems like that. Sequential planning under uncertainty. I'm going to have a timeline that's going to, we are here today at TS0. And we're going to have to get to some timeline where we start doing things uh, here, drilling or monitoring or injecting. And at the end, we're going to come out with a reward, which is, is it safe? Is it cost effective? And did it achieve what I wanted to, do, to achieve? So that's a lot of questions that we have to now start addressing right now, instead of waiting, which I call reacting. Instead of start doing something, waiting and seeing what happens and reacting, reacting, that's going to get slow and not cost effective. So here's a, a tutorial example of uh, how that could work in a very simple synthetic example. So here we have an example where we're going to inject CO2 in the subsurface. That's where the arrow is. And that, that curve you see is a cap rock. It's a layer, let's say, and we're injecting in there and stays in there because that layer is completely sealing, but you have faults on the side, right? And if faults on the side and you start injecting, you can see that after a while it spills over to another side or it could spill over all the way down to the fault. And then you get earthquakes or you get leakage. So what does this AI do? 
Here on the left-hand side, you see that we are ejecting in that high peak. And then you see these blue arrows, which are monitoring arrows. That means we are sensing at those locations what's happening. And you see we're injecting, continue injecting. You also see that we don't know, of course, what exactly the layering is in the subsurface. It's uncertain. Right? So if you have almost no data, like in the beginning, you have no data, you're very uncertain, and so you have a lot of these gray curves. Everything is very uncertain. But then as you go on, right, you become more certain, and so these gray curves start to narrow. And so now the question then is, like, how do I do safe injection? How do I get the CO2 in the subsurface uh, and account for this uncertainty, which is critical? So let's uh, break that down, right? There are essentially a number of components here now. Because if we're going to a formulation and a definition of things, let's look at some of these components. So in AI, we talk about not uncertainty, but we talk about belief, which is what we believe the current state of the system is, and that is not certain. We may not know whether there is one hump or two humps or where that layer exactly is. We have, however, uh, we have technology to sense, right? Sensor technology, and there are many sensor technology. You can put stuff on the surface. Uh, you can use electromagnetic waves. You can use seismic waves. You can use all kinds of devices, but typically they will be on the surface, right? Because drilling in the subsurface is very expensive. Then we have actions, right? Engineering actions. We're going to have to do something. And doing something means rates, deciding on rates to inject, on rates to extract, and on placement of, of where these uh, wells need to be, et cetera, et cetera. So now we can put all of that together in, in one framework, and this framework formulation is called a partially observable mark of decision process, or POMDP. It's a common framework in uh, artificial intelligence, and it's also the topic of uh, research at the CISL uh, lab. So what is that? Okay, well, you see here that in this dynamic decision network, we're going to couple these elements together. Right? We're going to have take an action at some time t. That's going to result in some reward, right? How much you inject. And that reward, however, is not certain. Right? That reward, rt, is depending on an uncertainty at this time, bt. That uncertainty, however, can be reduced or affected by observations. Right? So observations are going to improve on your uncertainty and will hopefully reduce uncertainty. And so then we go forward in time, namely, we're going to use those observations to update uncertainty and create new uncertainty. And then we walk on and on. So this is a formulation of this problem, and this graph keeps on going. We actually don't know how many steps we need to take, right? So the amount of steps, the amount of actions are part of the problem. There we go. So now the question is, once we have formulated this problem, how do we solve this problem? And the solution of this problem is very hard because just like, uh, this is a deep mind video block, it's just like playing chess or playing Go, right? You have many moves you can make. And as you make more moves, and then more moves appear in the future. It's harder than chess because as I mentioned, uncertainty comes in. So not only do we have, uh, dimensionality of all the possible actions we can take, but it also dimensionality relates to all the states that can be observed in the future. We don't know the subsurface. It will only get revealed to us as we operate uh, down in the future. So we've done that uh, a little test, uh, and this is a report. I happen to share that report with you that compares solving that problem of CO2 injection in the subsurface for that little toy problem and see what happens. So if you are doing random things, that's not very good, right? That's kind of a baseline. Then there is best guess. That means that you ignore uncertainty. You just assume you know the, the subsurface. 
Then you have fixed schedule, which is something that people do a lot today, which is we just plan the thing and then we let it run. Right? We plan where we drill. It's an expert policy. And then we let it run and we just observe with monitoring, but we don't optimize monitoring. Then we have PUMC Power, which is a solver uh, uh, that developed in the Sizzle Lab uh, with basic uncertainty quantification. And then we have PUMC Power with sequential import and resampling, which is a Bayesian uncertainty quantification. And so the only winner that will never leak is the AI. All of the other solutions leak, despite the fact that the system thinks or you think it's not leaking. What is critical here is uncertainty quantification. Proper handling of uncertainty quantification and proper handling of how actions and observations interact in the future. That can be extended to complicated set settings, right? Like real injection uh, facilities where you're going to have to decide if you get your CO2 from your cement factory on how you're going to inject it. Uh, and you may have to decide on where to inject it. You have to decide on how to monitor it. And there are many types of monitoring devices. But essentially, the formulation and the material solution remain the same. So here's then um, the answer to that. So here we are in the subsurface here. You have a plan view of the subsurface. And you see the order by which you inject. So that's the CO2 concentration, right? That, and that is the observation well that the AI has placed that keeps the system safe. That's not intuitive to anybody, right? That is what this AI does in this setting. This is difficult. Why is this difficult? Because in order to execute this, we need to simulate physically the system. Right? There's a physical simulation that goes behind that, that is flow in subsurface, or it's called multi-phase flow. Right? The way flow moves, uh, CO2 moves in the subsurface is, a, is itself a physical problem. It may take hours to do one simulation. Right? In order to find a solution, we may need to do millions of simulations. So how do we solve that problem? Um, that problem is solved using deep learning and the work done in Sally Benson's lab uh, and Gaga Wen, which wrote this beautiful paper on using deep learning for multi-phase flow uh, predictions. So here we're using neural networks that says, if you know the geology and you know what you're injecting, it can, this neural network can predict for you how much you're leaking and how much you're trapping, right? That itself is a quite, uh, an uh, important challenge. Okay. Let's move from Earth's heat or injecting things to Earth's minerals. What we're getting is the exact same formulation of the problem. So we're going to use the same formulation and we're going to use the same solver to solve a completely different problem. Like there's a power there that if you can generalize things to do many things, there is an interest there. So let's think a little bit about, talk a little bit about what is a battery metal deposit? Where does the metals that are in your phone, that go in your car, where did they come from? Well, they were formed a very, very, very long time ago right at the mantle here, right? You get magma coming up, and then you have thinning of the crust where that magma can interact with the crust and create pathways. Now, this is a thousand, 10,000 kilometers, right? This is huge. And these move through cracks in the subsurface, and then these metals, which are in fluids, they interact with the crust for often sulfide, and sulfide with iron makes iron sulfide, copper sulfide, nickel sulfide, things like that, and they get deposited. What does that look like? Well, we can look at that 
by looking at already mined deposits where they have very good mapping of what that looks like. This is what a metal deposit looks like, right? It can sit up to 1,000 kilometer, 1,000 meters in the subsurface, and it has this kind of weird shape, right? It's an intrusion type shape. And so here we see what is called a massive sulfide is a concentration of nickel, copper, and cobalt, which are sulfides, and they tend to go, go together. Now, when you stand on the surface, you see nothing. You can walk here. That could be something down here. How do you know it's there? That's the hard part of mineral exploration. A lot of the stuff that's at the surface is already found. Well, in a way, mineral exploration starts from space. Geologists look at the entire planet and discover, of course, that's long been discovered, areas in the world that are suitable or prone to having mineral deposits. And those are where the crust was thin, right? And where you had the magma coming up instead of that. Here we are in Lake Superior, where there is mineral exploration going on for nickel, for example. And so that was a mid-continental rift system. That was where essentially the crust was thinning. Then people say, well, how do we find that a mineral deposit? Then you have to do a lot of machine learning from existing data that existing in that area and try to find in the subsurface through machine learning on geophysical data, magnetic data, all kinds of geochemical data and whatnot, to find an intrusion. So you've gone now from this very large scale to a 10 kilometer scale. This is in the subsurface, right? At, if you stand there, you would not see that. So that sounds interesting. And then people say, what can we do then? Well, then we can go local and put things on the ground, sensors, right? Here, these are electrodes uh, and loops that give you electrical signals. Of course, uh, a metal is conductive. It's, it's uh, it has these nice properties, it's heavier, uh, and so we can detect that. But a lot of things look like a metal deposit, and a lot of things are conductive. So we get like a, a blobby thing that says there's something here. Right? Then you have to go and drill. You see this large sequence of data acquisition uh, that is needed in order for you to do something where the success rate today is less than 1%. That's a huge capital investment for 1%. What is the critical problem here? Again, uncertainty. And that's where it gets much different from the Earth's heat part, because Earth's minerals are a whole lot less understood and then layers in the subsurface containing that heat. And so Kurt House, who's the CEO of Cobalt Metals, has come up with this idea of Bayesian mineral exploration. This is uh, truly innovative because nobody in the mineral exploration does base. Right? So I've written about that uh, a while ago uh, called Bayesianism, right? which is a way of reasoning about uncertainty. Right? If you talk about intelligence, how do we reason about uncertainty? Humans are not good at reasoning about uncertainty. In my career, I've worked 25 years with all kinds of companies, and reasoning about uncertainty is very, very difficult. People like to be certain and like to land on one single solution and then say, that's my best solution. There is no best solution. There are many solutions possible. How do we reason about that? Well. We have to then start understanding why this curve is happening. This curve is happening because of the effect of high false positive rate. That means there's a lot of exploration going on that finds absolutely nothing. In fact, it's about one in 200 that finds something. It means 199 failures. Why are there failures? Because people want to be too certain. That, that's why I like to add this person to the picture, in the picture, which is Karl Popper, who's a philosopher who talked about falsification. It means we can't really prove anything right. We can only prove things wrong. That means we should be gathering not evidence for something, 
but we should be gathering evidence against something. And that's a hard sell. You should try to try to falsify your hypothesis rather than try to confirm your hypothesis. So the question then for AI is, what is the sequence of falsifying versus confirming data? If you are starting with large uncertainty, you want to be falsifying. If you start reducing uncertainty, you want to start confirming, but not too early. What is that sequence? Where is that balance? Humans can't find that balance. We need something else. So Bayes, for those who like a little uh, math and seen that in their courses, right? this Bayes formula is, is a very, looks like a very simple formula, but it has a lot of consequences. Uh, in particular, the idea of prior distribution. What do we know right now, and how does information change that? In the Earth, we have our models are extremely complicated, right? Earth is complicated. We don't know much about it. It's 3D varying, and we have to do all that. There's many types of information. And so what sequence of future information is going to reduce uncertainty? And we have to plan that today, right? We can't be reacting all the time. So that's why we have developed what is called the intelligent prospector. So the intelligent prospector is a program that can reason about uncertainty and make decisions in the future, many steps ahead of what is the optimal data acquisition, what are the optimal actions to be done. You see that this is embedded into a machine prospector, which is machine learning, which is needed. And also it requires data. Where does that data come from? Well, data goes back a very, very long time. And so Cobalt Metals has developed an NLP for unstructured data. That means it can read geological reports written from the 50s and start to figure out unstructuredly where are areas of interest, right? This is not a measurement you take at one location. This is like a report written by some person who was sitting in some, in some institute somewhere about something that's called pyrite and pyrotite, and they make spelling mistakes because you see geology is complicated, right? And there's pyridotype and there's all these names. So how do we make sense of all that? How do you can put that? Here, actually, actually in, in, in Africa, you have even hand-drawn maps with colored by a person, right? That You say, well, is that really important information? It's actually quite crucial because it's unbiased information. This is information that was created before anything was found, right? That is really important information because it's not biased by where people went and then used their own ideas uh, on, on that. So where is intelligent prospector now being applied or going to be applied? And that is in the very important area in the world, which is the copper belt. So the world, if you think about copper, right? We can think about batteries and how we change batteries. We're going to always need copper. In fact, according to the 25th plan, we need to go from 20 to 30 million today, from 20 million to 30 million more copper, million metric tons of copper. Uh, so most copper in the world is in South America, like Chile and Peru. But the copper belt, where here you have the Congo, and here you have... Uh, uh, Zambia or DRC, and you have Zambia is a significant source. Why is Zambia so important? And this comes a little bit already to the human centered part, right? Which is international security. Africa will have 3 billion people by the end of the century and is strategically enormously important, right? This is the Af US Africa Summit uh, that was uh, held in December and where a big deal was announced between uh, cobalt metals and a uh, Zambia ZCM a mining uh, conglomerate uh, to use Intelligent Prospector to apply that and find more copper near known existing copper deposits, which you see these are all copper mines. So why AI and why did that come up as the main selling point? Let's see how copper is developed right now in the copper belt. So in the copper belt, you see all these dots here. Those are drill holes. Those are very expensive to do. 
right? And they take a lot of time to do. Not only lots of money, but also a lot of time that goes into drilling. You see that they drilled everywhere, right? And they drill how? They drill on a regular grid. Why would you do that? Because in that setting, they don't account for any uncertainty or don't account for how future information will impact the planning. And so, uh, therefore, you're spending a lot of time doing that. I can't show you any real results of the intelligent perspective, of course, because of the sensitivity of this, but I can show you how it works. Here you have a synthetic example where imagine there is ore, which is very discrete, copper ore, right? That could be a blob over here. And maybe it's more not like a blob, but maybe it's a layer or something. And you want to discover that. And currently, that's what you know. That fuzzy thing. We know very little. We have lots of uncertainty. What is it that we want? Well, we want to know whether if we're going to drill in this area, that we get something that's economical. Right? There is a cutoff here that says we're going to invest or we're not going to invest. And here is the dollar amount or the grade or whatever that you have that you want to achieve. Right now, this is the uncertainty. We have lots of uncertainty, and it looks like you're above, but there's a chance of below. Right? The idea is to reduce this uncertainty such that we know it's above or below. What people do now is they drill on these regular grids and keep doing that until they find an answer, and it takes very long. So what does intelligent prospector do? It doesn't do that. Here is the path that an AI would take that will then reduce uncertainty, right? You see, this path is not that, right? This path is taken such that after an amount of drilling, you can figure out what the uncertainty is and whether you're above or below the cutoff. This is not um, a case where, where you drill and then you wait and you drill and you wait. No, this is a case where the first drill hole is, in fact, a function of the future drill holes that you will drill, like playing chess. We don't play chess one move at a time. We play chess by moving, thinking about many moves in the future. And so what's very interesting about this AI, it looks random, but it is not random. If you look very carefully, the AI will be the first one. It actually moves away from the deposit. That is falsifying. And as it you know more, it may come in and start confirming, falsifying, confirming, falsifying, confirming. We cannot figure that out. Right? That is what is needed here. OK, let's talk a little about the human impact, right? Human-centered AI, because mining is going to mean something for people. So with cobalt metals, uh, we're looking at exploration here in Disco Island. Disco Island is in Greenland, right? Big, uh, lots of ice in Greenland, and ice is very, very important. In fact, if you look at Disco Island, next to Disco Island is the Jakobshaven Glacier, which is one of the most studied glaciers in the world. If this glacier collapses, the sea level will rise by meters. And so we are looking for minerals because of the melting ice next to the glaciers. Now, Greenland is not without people. In fact, Greenland has a 50,000 people native community. Right? So are we going to now mine for us, affecting native communities all over the world? Is our AI going to be without heart or with heart? Right? Here we see this was a very controversial thing in Greenland about the rare earth uh, election. Rare earth elements are very important also for renewable energy. Uh, and, uh, but this, this could occur with, in this case, uranium. And so the Inuit already won the election because they didn't want to have the mining. Now, not all mining is the same. Here on the left, 
we have a very high grade nickel mine in Canada. On the right, we have a low grade gold deposit in Australia. We are here in the northern part of Canada, lots of wind, wind energy combined with mining. Look at the footprint. You have a very small deposit in the subsurface, you mine that part, and that's it. This here is awful. And you know where the gold goes? Where does the gold go? In the vault. That's where that gold goes. It goes in the vault. Right? I always think like if 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 aliens would come like look at our planet and say, why are they mining a big hole in the ground and putting it in a vault? Right? That's madness. This needs to stop. So, for that reason, we've started this initiative, right? Because the AI we've developed has spurred action. It is having an effect uh, in critical minerals, but we also need to have a human part and a human effect that needs to be studied. So that requires building community. That requires everybody around the table, right? And so we're building our neutral space where people can come visit us, whether they are a native community, whether they are a mining company, whether they are a government organization, uh, learn about each other things and make sure that everybody is involved in that prosperity. So there will be a first conference that we're launching if you're interested in this topic. Uh, and visit our website. Uh, you'll get updates on that. It'll be on Stanford here uh, in June. And uh, by that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we'll do questions now. Uh, we have a few from online. But I think we'll do audience first. Um, do we have any audience questions? So actually, I have, you have a question about the, the result of your injector carbon dioxide in the ground. So you said that the leakage is zero, but I see the efficient the traffic efficiency is not, not as good. So can you explain yeah. what, what's that? Yeah, so that is in that particular synthetic case, right? It also means that there is no there is no high efficiency in that system unless you go for leakage. So you can have high efficiency, but you always get leakage, right? And so that's a little bit of a danger that you have a case where, oh, it looks like I have high efficiency, but in fact, high efficiency will occur with leakage. So then you have to make the balance, right? That are we going to take high efficiency or leakage? And that's the reward part. So what the AI is discovered is here is that you add a constraint to the system where you say leakage is not allowed, period, right? And then the efficiency drops, but that is just reality. Yeah. To make the object function for the leakage, but actually the efficiency is also important. So sometimes uh, I, I I don't think that leaking out of a CO two reservoir is allowable. It's not allowable. Got you. you know why? Because it will stop all CCS uh, injection all over the world when people start seeing the effect of leaking. That will stop that operation. Because, you know, people, when some people start noticing, earthquakes are easy to notice, right? But of course, CO2 leakage is also something we push on the next generation. That is not for us. This leaking is going to happen for possibly a long term. I see. Thank you. Right. We'll take one from online. Um, so this person is, I feel like battery grid storage advocates ignore the larger uh, capex per storage duration compared to pump hydro and green hydrogen. Similarly, similarly for relative costs of CCS versus decarbonization with renewables plus storage. Is there an intelligent agent solution to those misunderstandings? So I think that's a good question. I don't work on that. I don't work on systems analysis. I, I says I get my hands dirty. I'm an engineer, so I like to get my hands dirty. Uh, I do think there's room for sequential decision-making and systems modeling, right? Uh, not just decision-making, 
which means making a decision, let's do this, A, right? But about sequential decision, because as you will deploy, you will get information, right? So then again, it's how do you, how do you interweave actions, decisions on what systems to use, like that person is alluding to, together with future information that you will get out of these, uh, of these analysis. And that is, I think, where sequential planning can be used in that systems analysis, but that's not what I, what I do. Energy sources. I'm curious whether or not other planets uh, that I understand we are observing now to find out any of that material. And the one thing I haven't heard you mention as a power source is gravity. And I'm wondering whether or not any of these other uh, worlds, or whatever you want to call it, may have some material that may have an effect on that as far as using them. Well, gravitational. It's batteries. Uh, gravitational store, uh, gravitational store is, is part of the possible plants, but then the question again is like this question before how do we knit all these plants together and build a system, right? And so that's more of a decision making around our policy around what, what are particular sources of storage you would use. So, so the question that's not research I do, right? I want to be very clear about that. Uh, the question. Which I do is is developing how such plans would be made and executed in the real world. Right. So there are so many options right now. It's like, what do we do? Does people say we should be doing CCS? Other people say we should not be doing CCS. Right. So th those are more of the of the policy questions. I th I think. I'm sorry. That's, that's why I would encourage my colleagues who work in that area to partially observable mark of decision processes. And, and, and that kind of field uh, that will help, I think, tremendously in making better decisions today. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is a human question. I know human is messy. And then, um, so you mentioned there, um, you want to um, define the uh, desired out outcome, but who defined that, right? That's uh, critical. And also, um, you know, as they add, have a random forest, <laughs> you know, you can have multiple, you know, you can generalize whatever, all the decision already made, and then maybe there's another layer of uh, optimization. So just your comments about that. So I think the, the, the human aspect and the regulatory aspect is going to be important. Right now, uh, there is almost no regulatory, quantitative regulatory aspect around injecting. There are EPA standards, but those EPA standards are rather vague around what needs to be done. For example, we need to build a geological model and we need to get sufficient data and, and, and so on. So there is, in, in the regulatory frameworks, there's still a lot of vagueness around these aspects of uncertainty and risk, right? And here we have shown that if you don't do uncertainty right, then you will get leakage despite the fact you think you don't get it, right? So then we have to think about what are new regulatory frameworks we need to develop around these things that can help humans become more confident in that this is going to work. So that is something that needs to be rolled out. Um, there's also frameworks around environmental aspects, right? So one of the things that we'd like to work on is um, mining in the rainforest. Now, that sounds bad, right? But most bad mining in the rainforest is gold mining, which we don't do. Uh, mining in the rainforest may, in fact, if you could look at nickel, may, in fact, put a give people an eco economy, a uh, manufacturing economy that is different from cutting the wood or making palm oil, right? So that is done. But then we have to be careful that we don't overuse water. We don't overuse energy, that we engage with local communities and say, you know, this is something we'd like to learn from you about the forest rather than us going there and just 
telling them what to do, what we should be doing or not doing. So those are all very, very uh, important questions. I think that we're just starting to look into. Uh, so we only have a few more minutes. We'll do one last uh, question. Uh, yep, yeah, go ahead. So um, one, thank you for the talk. It's been really interesting. And what I was curious about was the title of this talk was 2050. Um, you've talked a lot about speed and scale. You mentioned the Paris Climate Accords, and you've thrown out a couple figures here. But I was wondering, in actuality, what the practicality of a lot of this is in terms of that timeline that we're talking about, and in terms of the net effect that this will have on climate, for instance, uh, the central question of today's talk. And so I was hoping you could speak a little bit more to what this looks like in practice. You've given a couple of examples, whether that be Vienna or you know, places in Australia and Canada, but as a whole, what does this actually look like and what can we expect from some of the technologies that you've talked about today? That's a question that keeps me up at night. Right? Is to how, how do we now do this? There's cobalt metals, there's OMV, there's, there's these individual, but how do we get investors mostly? interested in this technology and start looking into that and you know expanding that i'm just one person right um the initiative is really also to go worldwide i think we talked earlier about how a lot of what we do in ai is for the western world right so how would there are people living in indonesia people living in south america and africa what does that mean for them Right? So that is where these Africa summits and things like that, they're very, very important. Now, the answer to that is I'm not going to make any predictions because I, I, I work in the area of certainty quantification. So <laughs> I know how dangerous predictions are. But we have to get things on the ground. Right? It's good to make these policy analysis that's very important. What's equally important is start digging in the earth and putting in geothermal systems under buildings and, and things like that and how that would go and how fast that would go, right? That's what we just need to start doing. But great question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, for those of you who are interested in kind of the intersection of AI and sustainability, we do um, have a recently published industry brief on the research going on at Stanford at this intersection. And um, Jeff's work is actually highlighted in that brief. So um, online, on our website, you can find it. And then the people online, there'll be a link in the chat. Um, and then finally, please join us next week. The seminar will be on the AI 100 with Michael Littman, a computer science professor at Brown University. Um, and the AI 100 is a 100-year study of artificial intelligence. Um, it's administered through HAI, but it is overseen by a group of um, AI experts from around the world. So we hope to see you there. Thank you all so much for coming. And thanks again, Thank Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa.